Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you all here this morning for our homecoming Sunday. And I'd like to invite the students to come forward now and give us our announcements. Good morning. Welcome to Harvard Church's homecoming Sunday. Am I on? Yeah. Hey, okay, I can hear you. Uh, a couple announcements. Please join us after the service for snacks provided by the worship committee and the Presbyterian women in the Air Condition Heritage Room. So please join us. The second thing is you'll see there's a flyer in your uh, in your bulletin about food pantry needs. Please take a look at them, and if you can, provide buy those kind of items. We have a bin in the Heritage Room, and we have a bin outside the CEC uh, where the administrative office is on. Just drop them off. We're checking them every couple of days or so. Finally, uh, Undy Sunday is the 31st of October. And leading up to Undy Sunday, we will have a bin here in front of the sanctuary that says Undy Sunday, and that's a picture of a little kid that you can see in the, uh, the handout. And we're looking for new underwear for the, the people of the micro ministry. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking, we're looking for new underwear. New, <laughs> not very young, and heavily starched. New underwear for men and women, t-shirts and underwear. Uh, medium, large, and extra large. Some of the people are kind of large. And the reason they request white is because the people can sign up and they can take showers and then the micro personnel will either have clean underwear for them or they assess the underwear that's laying there um, and, and provide the underwear for them just in case they didn't decide to, to switch it out. So if you could, starting the 3rd of October, not the 1st of October, the 3rd of October, there will be a bin here for the underwear for Micah's Undie Sunday. And then on the 31st, it will all be taken down to Micah. And finally, there is no Sunday school or confirmation today. Judy, Judy, Judy. Psalm 77, verses 11 and 12. I will remember the Lord's works. Yes, yes I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all you have done and meditate on your actions. Please join me now in our call to worship found, or excuse me, our prayer of adoration found just below the call to worship in the bulletin. And join me as we pray together with one voice, saying, Loving God, Full of compassion, I commit and commend myself to you, in whom I am 
and live and know. Be the goal of my pilgrimage and my rest by the way. Let my soul take refuge from the crowding turmoil of worldly thought beneath the shadow of your wings. Let my heart, this sea of restless waves, find peace in you, O oh God. Amen. And now to Laura for our opening hymn. Good morning, Harwood. Our opening hymn is Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, and it's number 76. Now there are five verses, but we're only going to do verses one, two, and five. Would you please stand at the table? takes away our sins and the sins of all the world's people. Please join me now in our prayer and confession as we pray together with one voice sing. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, so we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. With the glory of your holy name. Amen. Please take a moment now for quiet personal reflection. from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification, by the Spirit, and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
and pray to the Lord, please, Lord, remember how I have walked before you faithfully and wholeheartedly and have done what pleases you. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Isaiah had not yet gone out of the inner courtyard when the word of the Lord came to him, go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord God of your ancestor David says. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Look, I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the Lord's temple. I will add 15 years to your life. I will rescue you and this city from the group of the grasp of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. The reading from the New Testament is from John 5, verses 1 through 3 and 5 through 16. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and realized that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. He replied, The man who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you to pick up your mat and walk? They asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing things on the Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a couple of weeks ago, I was on my way here one morning, and I came to the light at Gateway Boulevard and Route 3. And you probably know where that is. It's close to the Home Depot over there on Route 3. And there was a lot of traffic. And I noticed that there was this car in the right turn lane, and I, I was in the left turn lane, and this car was trying to get over into the left turn lane. And somebody in the middle lane let him merge, and then I waited to let him merge in front of me. And I thought that was a nice thing, or maybe a good thing, or a good deed to do. And the car was almost beside the car in front of me, so he had to make this almost really hard left turn to get into that lane. Well, the light changed, and we all pulled up, but we didn't get through the light. And so we were kind of sitting there. And the light changed again. And the cars in front of us began to move forward and make their left turn onto Route 3, to get on 95. And this car didn't move. And just as I was getting ready to politely tap my horn, the car in front of me jolted forward. Now, you've all seen people do this, right? This person's looking at their phone and all of a sudden they realize that everybody in front of them moved like two seconds ago. And in traffic, two seconds is a long time. And now this car starts moving at a pretty good clip. And the light turns yellow. And then the light turns red. But the car is moving too fast to stop. And he blasts through the red light. I mean, it wasn't even pink. It was, it was the Washington football team bright red. I know it's maroon, but still, you know what I mean. And so I stopped at the light. And I have to confess, I was a bit mad and a bit feeling sorry for myself. And instead of just getting over it, because in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't matter, right? I thought to myself, you know, 
No good deed goes unpunished. And that could be said of Jesus' experience in today's passage. No good deed goes unpunished. Now, this would be a good time for you to pull out your sermon notes. You can kind of follow along and see where we're going today. First, we see the miracle. Then we see where we find the theme for the passages that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. We see the resistance to the Messiah. And then we learn that we are blessed when we follow Jesus' example. As today we find that serving God is not always easy, but in the end, it's worth it. Now, first we see the miracle. We join Jesus today, and he's in Jerusalem for one of the three major Jewish festivals that in the Old Testament required people to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. These were Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost. Now, John doesn't tell us which one it was, so we're not sure, but it probably was Passover. And Jesus is at the Pool of Bethesda, the, the one in the Holy Land, not one of the ones up in Maryland. Now, the pool was near the Sheep Gate, and this was the city gate where the sheep entered through the city walls to be sold at the temple for the, the many sacrifices that were required at the temple worship. And the main purpose of this pool was probably to water the sheep. Now there's a legend that occasionally an angel would come down and disturb the water. And after that, the first person that got in the water would be healed of whatever illness or malady they had. And so there were a lot of very sick people sitting on the edge of this pool waiting for the water to be stirred so they could be the first one in and be healed. Now, you can actually visit the Pool of Bethesda today in Jerusalem. Surprisingly, it's located three or four stories below ground level because over the last 2,000 years, people have built all kinds of other structures over the things around the pool. And, you know, Jerusalem's kind of in a desert land, and there's a lot of dust, and so that dust kind of piles up on top of itself. And, you know, people have, you know, whatever debris or whatever that kind of gets piled up in there, too. Um, and so that's why it's about three or four stories below ground level. Now, I have observed this uh, phenomenon, and you can observe it, too. All you have to do is go into the room of any teenager just before their parents tell them to clean up their room, and you will see evidence of this phenomenon continuing today. <laughs> now, also on the same property is St. Anne's Church, which is only about 900 years old, and I gotta tell you, St. Anne's has amazing acoustics. I visited this church several times and heard several people sing in it, and you can sit anywhere in this building, or in that building, and hear with perfect clarity. It's as good, if not, in some cases, better than many modern sound systems. But back to Jesus. So Jesus is walking past the pool of Bethesda, probably on his way to the temple, and he sees one of these people who has an illness, and Jesus approaches this man. Now, John tells us that this guy had had whatever illness he had for over 38 years. It's a long time. We're not sure how long he had been sitting by the pool. If it was anywhere near that time, this guy is really tenacious. Now, think about it. Over 38 years, this ailment has kind of become this person's lifestyle, if you will. It's his job, if you will, to sit by the pool and wait for the water to be stirred. And so Jesus says, do you want to get well? Now, what Jesus is really asking him is, do you really want to change? Because sometimes people become comfortable with what we might think is an unpleasant situation. And they really don't want to change into what we might call a more pleasant situation. One scholar says that on the surface of it, this is a stupid question. But the scholar goes on to say that Jesus never asked useless questions. The question gets the man's attention, focuses on his need, and expresses Jesus.
Jesus' loving kindness toward this man. Now the man doesn't answer the question. He makes a statement and says, there's nobody to help me get in the pool. Because he thinks the only way for him to be healed is through the pool. It never occurred to him that Jesus, this man talking to him, might be able to heal him. And then, Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, commands the man to pick up his bed and walk. And the man does. His body is miraculously healed. It's as if he's compelled to obey Jesus' words. Now, I want you to notice a couple of interesting details here. This man showed absolutely no evidence whatsoever of faith in Jesus. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. He didn't ask. Jesus performed this miracle and healed this man. Because, you see, it was the love of God the Son for this frail and sick person that healed him. Now, perhaps faith came to him as a result of this miracle. We're not sure. But another thing we see here is that serving God is not always easy. But in the end, it's worth it. And now we're going to see the not always easy part as we see the resistance to the Messiah. Now, John points out that this is the Sabbath day. And one commentator says that that fact is the key to the whole passage because it is the spark that lights the fire of the religious establishment's resistance to the Messiah. And that resistance is going to intensify over time until it culminates in the cross. In Exodus 20, we find the Ten Commandments. And in verses 8 to 11, we find the commandment to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So we're told to work for six days and to rest for one day, just as God did in the act of creation. It doesn't define work in detail, though. The Jewish religious leaders had established a lot of details that defined what work was on the Sabbath. And unfortunately, somewhere along the line, they kind of lost the point in the details. Jesus is being very calculating here to try to refocus them on what's really important by doing this healing on the Sabbath. His intent is to refocus them on the holiness of God and the rest of human beings and to focus them away from honoring people who are pursuing personal pride in their fabricated religious piety. So some of the religious authorities see this man carrying his mat, and they confront him, and they say, you, you can't carry your mat on, on the Sabbath. And he gives them a perfectly good explanation. He says, the man who told me to pick up my mat and walk told me to do this. Who was this man, the religious leaders demand? Now, the man didn't know Jesus' name because, you see, Jesus had already slipped away into the crowd. So he couldn't tell them. But later on, Jesus finds this man in the temple. And Jesus says, see, you're well. This wasn't some sort of magic trick. It's a permanent healing. But do not sin anymore or something worse might happen to you. Now, there are several examples in the Old Testament of God telling the children of Israel not to do this or not to do that because God would visit some sort of plague upon them for their sin. On the other hand, Jesus is asked about a tower falling on some people who are killed and they wanted to know what sin these people had committed. And Jesus says it wasn't because they committed any sins. And so in the Bible, it can be either way. But that's probably really not what Jesus has in mind here. What Jesus probably has in mind here is calling this man to repent of his sins, to turn away from sin in general, not because a worse disease is waiting for him, but because eternal separation from God would be waiting for him. Well, 
Then the man went and told the religious leaders who had healed him. Now, some of the scholars think that this man was betraying Jesus to the Jewish religious authorities. I'm, I'm just not sure it's that drastic. I think maybe this man is probably a little more naive. He doesn't know that this will set in motion the conflict that will lead to the cross. I think he was just excited to be healed and he was willing to tell anybody and everybody who was willing to listen to him about his healing after 38 years of suffering. And so, serving God is not always easy, but in the end, it's worth it. Well, now we see what happens when we follow Jesus' example. We find here Jesus being obedient to the Heavenly Father. Jesus is serving God by healing a person who suffers. Now, in the larger picture, Jesus is setting up a challenge to the religious establishment that has become more focused on human works and not focused enough on the God who called them to act in the first place. In the short run, Jesus is beginning a course that will continue until his death on the cross. In the long run, it will lead to Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven, back to the place of honor next to God, and eternal life for us, his followers. It's not going to be easy for Jesus, but in the end, it will be well worth it, both for him and for us. Adoniram Judson, excuse me, lived from 1788 to 1850. He's widely hailed as the first American missionary to go to another country and another culture to tell people about Jesus. He was tortured, starved, and imprisoned. He watched his wife, his children, and many of his friends die of various things. But in the end, he completed the translation of the Bible the entire Bible into the language of Burma. And that has been the difference for countless people who over the years have become followers of Jesus. And my understanding is that that translation is still being used in some parts of Burma. I'm sure that at this moment, Adonair Judson knows that in the end, it was worth it. Now, most of us are probably not going to suffer the things that Adoniram Judson suffered, let alone what Jesus suffered. Jesus was unique in human history, after all, right? But we can follow their example. We can follow their example by serving the Lord even when we're tired, even when things are tough, even when we don't want to. Because I have found, and I'm sure you have too, but like a lot of things in life, it may be difficult or uncomfortable or unpleasant when we're doing our service. But when it's over, we find it was worth it. And when we finally get home to be with Jesus, we will definitely find that it was worth it. Because serving God isn't always easy, but at the end, we'll find it's definitely worth it. Would you please join me in prayer? Father God, please give us strength. Give us passion. And give us opportunity to serve you. Even when it's not easy. And Lord, show us in the end that it's definitely worth it. In your precious name, amen. Our hymn is number 467, Anywhere in Jesus, found in the red hymn book. Please stand.
Sometimes that rest includes a rest from illness and infirmity. Lord, you heal us for your glory. And you heal us because it's part of your treating us with loving kindness. You heal us because you love us. Lord, we pray your healing would include those who are infected by COVID-19. And that the numbers of those infected with COVID-19 would once again begin to decrease instead of increase. We pray that our medical community would continue to have effective treatments and more well-developed vaccines to address the variants that become, that emerge. Lord, we pray for these things to become quickly and readily available. Lord, we pray for your strength and your healing for all those who have this disease, and we pray for your comfort for all of those who have lost a loved one. Lord, we continue to pray for all the members of our military, and all of our law enforcement officers, and all of our fire and rescue workers. We pray that you would bless them and protect them. We pray that you would give them wisdom and a powerful sense of justice that they may do their jobs well. Lord, as our thoughts turn closer to home, we continue to pray for Andy and for Chris. We pray for David and for Diana. We pray for Hazel and for Helen. We pray for Jessica and for Kathleen. We pray for Marilyn and for Michelle. We pray for Nick and we pray for Rick. We pray for Shirley. We pray for Sue and we pray for Teddy. In your precious name, amen. And now please take a moment and lift up your silent prayers to the Lord. Thy will be 
done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and turn to the back of your bulletin for our affirmation of faith. Our affirmation of faith this morning is an excerpt from the Heidelberg Catechism. Please join me now as we all state our faith with one voice the same. I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that the hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation, because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Please do be seated. And now our ushers will come forward and collect the gifts of God's people for the work of God's church. We bring our gifts to you, O God, in response to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, your word made flesh. May all we do be in response to the new life we have been given. Give us wisdom to use all our gifts to your glory. Amen. Our closing hymn is I Love to Tell the Story, number 297 in the Red Hymn.
hear our charge of benediction. Today our charge of benediction is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. May the Lord himself give you peace, always, and in every way. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.